Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami. We have today the pleasure of, of having uh, Beth Kolke from Seattle and her associate, Koji Intel Koffer. I got that right, Koji? Yeah, you got it. Bingo, the first time. <laughs> and, we're also, and we're also, uh, we have the honor of having Gene. Uh, oh, oh, man, I, I'm having a brain. Ostrovsky, that's all right. So I'm going to try to throw it. Ostrovsky, from, uh, he's the head editor of uh, MedGadget. And today we're going to talk, talk about the drip, drip assist, uh, a device that's designed to help uh, with any type of IV administration. And uh, they'll be talking about that. So welcome, Beth of Koji. Thank you very much for having us. Welcome. It's great to be here. <laughs> OK, uh, I, yeah, why don't you just talk a little bit about first, when you, when you start off, uh, Beth and Koji, a little bit about yourselves. Uh, your background, and then how you came to the project, and, be, and then go into describing the project. So I, uh, I am a professor, have been a professor uh, for about 20 years, actually started out as a literature professor, um, studied the internet back before it had pictures, kept up with the technology, and then got really, really good at understanding why people use technologies, and what made them fall in love with the technology, and, uh, but then I got to the point where I wanted to help build better stuff, not just understand tech. So I moved over to engineering. So for the last 15 years I've been a professor of human centered design and engineering and I started Shift Labs in 2012 to essentially fill a gap in the commercialization pathways for medical devices. So we wanted to create a business model that makes it sustainable and profitable for low cost devices to make it uh, onto the market and, and improve care and save lives. So we're responding to changes in the medical uh, <clears throat> the medical sector in emerging markets around the world, as well as changes in the U.S., sort of pushing more medical care outside of hospitals and more alternate site care, and we're just really excited about what technology allows today and the kinds of uh, gadgets, medical uh, devices that we can build that can really help people. Uh, and, uh, Koji, so I'm a mechanical engineer I'm out of Georgia Tech, um, and then I worked at uh, Philips Sonic Care for a couple of years before leaving that and pursuing my own startup. Um, and I worked on that for a few years um, and unfortunately had to shut it down. But uh, while I was looking for my next great adventure, that's when I ran into my co-founder here, Beth. Um, I like what she was trying to do with the medical design space. Um, and so I have been on board for two years now, almost exactly. So Very good. Now, how, how did the idea come to you, uh, Beth, of the drip assist? How, how exactly? What's the genesis of the idea? Well, when we started the company, we had no money at all. So we couldn't go do any research to figure out what kinds of problems people had. So I had done field work around the world. I'd been working in emerging markets as a researcher for a long time and had been to a bunch of hospitals. But I sat down with some doctors and nurses who worked overseas from different parts of the world, and I just sort of had them tell me about their day and listen to what was really hard about doing their job. And then I compared across each of those long interviews and identified about six common themes and then I sat down with a bunch of hardware hackers and I said, okay, well, which of these problems could we actually solve inexpensively? And there were about, about three that we thought, oh, we can come up with a, you know, a way to solve this. And our design theses is, uh, are that we want to build things that are affordable and simple, right? So it's like, which of these can we solve with a simple, affordable solution? And of the three, the Drip Assist was the one that we got the most excited about early on. And so that's why we're here today. Very good. And how uh, could you describe the product, please? Sure. So it's a, it's a it's a very simple. Here it is. Um, very simple product um, that uses essentially a little infrared beam to detect drops in the IV chamber. So you can actually turn it on and select what drop factor. So each tubing set has its own sort of um, uh, needle size. Needle size. Yeah. So the, uh, the size of the size of the drop that's falling. Just in here. There you go. And then as the drops fall through, the device will simply detect them, and it can tell you how many millis per hour you're, you're dosing, how many drops per minute, and what your total volume is. And then there's also a nice little feature that's an alarm. So once you get a nice steady flow rate, you can turn on your alarm. If you get a runaway bag or the fluid stops completely, the device will tell you. Turn it right back off. So you can see one sitting right up here. It just uh, attaches to the drip chamber like that. So it's... it's Oops. There you go. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's cool. Hangs on. And that's all there is to it. Oh, and it runs on a little single AA battery, which is really uh -huh. nice. And it'll run about two weeks continuously if you just left it on. 
on that one double A? Well, it's pretty pretty straightforward and simple. Um, now, in that you, before the show, we briefly just uh, talked about the places where it's used, and you said not only disaster areas, but first, could you talk about disaster areas? Why it would be beneficial? Oh, in disaster areas, sure. So the really the the double A battery we think is one of the great things about it. So it's super portable, um, and you can find a double A battery anywhere in the world, um, and it'll last for a long time on that battery. So the that sort of power um, issue makes it really great for any kind of mobile um, or austere setting, but also the simplicity of it. So we worked really, really hard to make it a simple design, and we say that anyone can be trained on this device in under five minutes, uh, and we're proud of that. <clears throat> but what that means is, in a, in a disaster setting, you might have uh, caregivers, clinicians, who are used to using infusion pumps, who are then forced to be doing manual gravity infusion. and you know, it's the kind of thing that if you haven't done it a lot, sometimes the equations, the conversion equations, aren't at the tip of your tongue. And so with a device that's this simple that you can learn to use almost instantaneously, it's a great backup uh, for providers. So they can still give precision infusions. Well, you know, that's one thing I was always amazed at in, in the emergency room. We would bark out orders to, for nurses to start a drip, and, and they have to calculate it on the fly, and frequently in very tense situations. Uh, and this kind of simplifies it. I, I, get, I suppose it has a place also in third world countries where the nursing staff is not, you know, really well trained. Well, so there, yeah, so anywhere where you don't have a lot of training, um, but also where you really need uh, precision. So if it, it, as this bag gets lower here, that rate is automatically going to get slower. That's just the way gravity works. And so it saves time also. So the nurses instead of having to go back to the bedside and make sure and readjust using this roller clamp, they can just set the device, kind of set and forget, right? And when it gets um, out of, uh, outside their safe zone, the alarm will go off. So it's, it's really, it's designed to save time, but also increase the accuracy of those infusions. Mm -hmm. Gene, do you have any questions? Oh, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I was wondering, like, uh, you say it works for two weeks on one battery. Why is it so... It requires so little power. Um, it's just a lot of uh, engineering work. So you know, we worked on selecting uh, an LCD screen that drew very little current. Um, we do things like pulse the, the LED uh, emitter and sensor, uh, choosing the correct components and designing the, the circuit in such a way that it draws very little current. Um, there's, there's really all there is to it. And then yeah, the simplicity of the design and the functionality helps a lot. So the screen that we use an LCD screen that draws very little power by choice. So it's not, you know, it's not a beautiful full color backlit screen, um, but it'll last a whole lot longer. Right. Uh, has anyone else tried to make something like this before? That's low cost and uh, uh, does it? Yeah. Does so it? We've, we've seen a couple um, advertised online in other countries that we haven't been able to get our hands on. I've talked to doctors in Pakistan and India and China who use devices that are made in China. I think there's one in India too. Um, you know, I've talked to people who've used them. Uh, there was one that was on the market briefly, or at least, actually, I don't know how for how long, in the UK. We were able to get one of those. Um, but when you do a comparison of our devices against um, all of the other ones that we've been able to find, uh, we have... Uh, a higher accuracy, lower cost, and better power management. So the the next cheapest option that would be close to us required wall power, and we really didn't want to do that. We wanted it to just be sit in your hand and you can take it with you. Sure. And the simplicity. In some cases, there's a there's actually like a lack of interface. So you never even know kind of what state the device is in. So Thanks. line goes a long way. So it's a better design and better engineer. It sounds like. Yeah, we really we emphasized. Uh, ways that engineering could make this device robust and valuable in low resource areas regardless of geography uh, and then we really paid attention to design so you know my background I'm all about that human centered design and we think it's time that medical devices thought about a beautiful design that people love to use. Well I, I know you guys aren't doctors but um you, I'm certainly, uh, you must be acquainted with the clinical indications for it in the field. Uh, in disasters, obviously, people in shock, 
Uh, what are the situations that are you generally acquainted with that a device like this would be uh, of good use? You know, John, one of the things that's so interesting is the more we work on this, the more we learn about. Yeah. Yeah, I know. There's a dog somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's my dog. I can't teach him, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. You should just, he should just join us. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's at the Westie. <laughs> I'll introduce you later. Oh, like, yeah. and the, your, your, your device is, uh, was originally uh, released for dogs, right? Well, for, uh, <laughs> there you go. It is, yes, exactly. Our first market <laughs> have been veterinarians. While we how, how did you uh, come up uh, going that way instead of going for uh, like clinical first? Oh, well, you know, it wasn't us. The veterinarians came to us. So that it was we did an early Indiegogo campaign, which Ben Gadget um, covered. And... Um, Thank you. And uh, there was a veterinarian distributor who, uh, I guess he he had a customer who wanted a flow meter. And so he was looking online thinking, I don't want to have to build this. He's an engineer as well. He was thinking, I don't want to have to build one. Surely someone makes one. And he found us. And we were still prototyping at that point, but he was really patient and diligent and kept checking back. And uh, in, um, what, 2014? Must have been 2014. January, we went to the, the big, one of the big national veterinarian conferences with him to get a sense of how strong the interest was and whether we should actually make a prototype run or a larger run that we would sell to veterinarians. There was, there was a lot of strong interest. And so that's how we ended up on the vet market. And it's been great because we've just had this wonderful experience to be able to have customers and get feedback and improve on the device. Uh, but John, you'd asked about the clinical indications, and the vets have helped with that as well. So, um, you know, when it comes to fluid resuscitation or even maintenance, for healthy adults, the rate doesn't have to be that exact. But for pediatric patients, for example, it's very important not to do uh, not to have fluid overload. Uh, if you have critically ill or malnourished adults, similar situation. Uh, and then we see medications like. Um, Oxytocin or magnesium sulfate used uh, with pregnant women, uh, where you want to have precision delivery, but most parts of the world don't have pumps as they administer those medications. Yeah, dopamine uh, also. Sorry. Dopamine, dopamine drips for. Dopamine, some malaria meds for kids, um, vasopressors. Um, nitro, nitro drips. I don't know if you guys use those. In, in, we haven't. Uh, we haven't done any work there. Okay. Yeah, that's like cardiac units. That's kind yeah. of a specialized. But, um, diabetic ketoacidosis um, is another indication that we have some clinicians interested in looking at it. So there's, like I said, we've the more we talk to clinicians, the more we learn about ways in which this can be useful. So the most recent for us has been um, uh, Ebola. And so one of these devices, I think, has a sticker on the back. Yeah, this one yeah. here. So that we um, ended up with... Uh, as um, uh, some money from USAID to uh, mm, test this and recognize it for use in Ebola treatment units cause, because oh, okay. giving fluids is one of those things that's really important during Ebola. So we're in the middle of that project. So uh, what other areas besides uh, you, you do it in undeveloped countries, but um, you mentioned before the show uh, home health care? Yeah, uh, home health, uh, disaster relief like Red Cross, um, alternate site care infusion centers, um, uh, infusion centers that are either attached to hospitals or standalone. Um, we've gotten a bunch of inquiries from hospitals, from distributors in, in Europe, actually, where they don't have an infusion pump at every bedside. Uh -huh. uh, what else? Di dialysis units? Are they, is there any interest there? So, well, there's interest, but I don't think this product is right for dialysis. Okay. It's not, the design isn't... Uh, we, we didn't design it to work in conjunction with dialysis equipment. Right, that's a little more complicated fluid uh, yeah. dosing, yeah. Now you mentioned you have other projects that you also you work on bringing other products to market. Mm -hmm. What other products, can you briefly tell us about that? Um, Some of the other things? Or, or is it secret? <laughs> well, we're, we are a little, we're a little cagey, it's true. Okay, you, know, um, you, have to, you don't have to tell us if you don't want to. Just say uh, things in the oxygen space. Oxygen is really important, mm -hmm. and uh, the both the method of generating and method of delivery uh, could use some improvements. So we've been looking at that. Very good. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience with using Indigo 
Indiegogo. Recently, uh, medical device startups have been kind of uh, testing the waters there. How, how has it been for you? So, um, Gene, were you editor when we did our Indiegogo? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I think that we were maybe one of the first medical device companies to do crowdfunding. Um, and so uh, you'll be happy to know that the FDA reads your website too. Oh, um, okay. Because after they, when they ran across our crowdfunding campaign, they reached out and emailed us. And um, they were great. They said, we want to help you not make a mistake. Uh, but it definitely changed uh, some of the ways in which we were working with our supporters. Wait, wait a minute. Someone said something nice about the FDA? <laughs> I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to write that down. Definitely. Wow. They, were, they were very nice. They were really supportive, and uh, they worked hard to be helpful. And they reached out to you about it. Uh, really? They did, yep. Wow, that, that is very decent of them to do yep. that. I, I didn't realize they were so proactive. Yeah, so they were, like I said, they were really, um, like we had no we had no idea. We, we didn't think we were making medical claims, but they thought we were. Oh, okay. um, so they were, uh, they, they were very patient in uh, helping to educate us, is what I would say. Very good. Uh, but I think, actually, when you look at things like um, Kinza or the, what's the tricorder one? Oh. Scanadu. Yeah, yeah, Scanadu. Yeah, like, Thank you. They have it totally dialed in in terms of how to manage the crowdfunding platform. I think that we were certainly early and uh, didn't have a good appreciation of how uh, complex the landscape is. So I think it's gotten more and more exciting. And well, it's, it's a, some of it is, is a bit misleading. Scanado was like a couple years late. It seems like I'm actually putting out a device. Yeah. Well. It turns out hardware's hard. <laughs> and when you add the regulatory level to it, there's there's a whole level of sort of unpredictability that comes into it. You never quite know what you're getting into until you start. So. Right. Very good. So what would you say? Would you recommend trying it or uh... crowdfunding for medical device? I'm not sure that I would actually. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. You know what? Uh, if we hadn't done the crowdfunding, the veterinarian. Uh, distributor never would have reached out to us, and we wouldn't have had a year of revenue while we wait for regulatory. Uh, wait to get through some regulatory hurdles. So, with people. Pardon me. It was a way for you to connect with people that that became important. Yeah. So someone told me once that crowdfunding isn't really about the money you raise; it's about exposure for your project. And intellectually, I, I agreed, but I didn't really understand until we launched the campaign what that meant. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing, the people who reached out from different countries, this vet distributor, uh, specific nurses who were excited. It was definitely about the exposure that the project got and allowed people who were interested in what we were doing to find us and contact us and uh, help make this better. Okay. How, how can people get in contact with you, uh, Beth? If well, they want to get in contact with you. They can uh, Google, Google, Google your name. Yeah, you could Google my name, but our company is called Shift. Lab. How do you spell that? S H I F T. Okay, just Google Shift. Shift Labs, and shift I'm uh, I'm Beth at Shift Labs. The, the website is shiftlabs.com. S H I F T L A B S dot com. Okay. Well, we're going to get fancy in the future. We'll actually blurb that on the on the screen, like they do on TV. But we're not there yet. Yeah. Uh, you can also reach out to us on Twitter at Shift Labs. Mm -hmm. Or on Facebook, actually. Yeah, we have a Facebook page, too. We have all these things. We do have all these things. But yeah, <laughs> if people are interested, we encourage them to reach out, um, email, send us a tweet. We uh, would love to hear from people who are either interested in the Drip Assist and Infusion generally, who are also working on uh, uh, products or projects that reach out to markets globally. Uh, it's an exciting place to be, and we love talking to other folks uh, doing some of the work. Great, great. Thanks, uh, Beth and Koji, for coming out, and thanks, Gene, for participating. And I uh, hope that things go well. It seems like a great product. Go ahead, Gene. Do you have something to say? I just wanted to thank everybody. Thanks for coming, and uh, I hope uh, best of luck to you, to you all with this project, and I uh, hope it's used around the world to save a lot of people.
Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to meet you both and uh, tell our story. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.